Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbro. Gino, how's it going? J-Love, I'm doing good. Getting better and better with those intros, my friend. Always making it happen. Today's guest is Brandon Turner. Brandon is the VP of Growth and Communications at Bigger Pockets, a very cool real estate social network that attracts all types of real estate professionals. He's an author, podcaster, and buy and hold investor. Today, we plan to pick his brain in order to gain some valuable insights from his investing career. So, without further ado, Brandon, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you guys for having me. This will be fun. Yeah, hey, it's Brandon. Be a good time. Hey, so let's get started. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into real estate. Sure. So my background, I started with uh, knowing nothing about real estate at all, other than I wanted to, you know, I wanted to live for cheap. That's the only thought I had in my mind. I was raised by a garage sale mom, you know, so we go garage selling every Saturday morning. And so, you know, no matter what I do in life, I got to get a good deal. So I was looking for a place to live and found out that it was cheaper for me to buy a house than rent it. And so I was like, okay, well, that sounds like a good deal. So I bought one. Uh, that needed a lot of work. Again, didn't know anything about it. I just thought, well, this one's cheaper than the rest. That probably is a good deal. So I bought that one, uh, rented out the rooms to some buddies, fixed it up, and I sold it, and I made about twenty grand uh, within about a year. And I thought, well, that was a lot of fun. I should do that again. And that's kind of what started the whole real estate adventure. I went from there to to rental properties and more flipping and all sorts of stuff. That is, uh, that's the path right there. I had a, uh, a doctor who was uh, heavily invested in real estate when I was getting started, and that was uh, his advice. And a lot of folks that we speak to you know, kind of go down that same path, either renting out a duplex or they get into uh, a deal like that. So that's great. Um, yeah. What, uh, what are you doing now? Today I do a lot I do a lot of holding on to my rental property. So I have 45, 46 somewhere in there units right now. Uh, I manage those. I'm picking up a new one, I don't know, every couple of months hopefully just trying to find, you know, various either single families. I like small multifamily properties a lot. Uh, I'm in the middle of a flip right now. Uh, I kind of do whatever I need to do to occupy my addiction to real estate. It's kind of like whatever deal comes in, I try to find a way to make it actually uh, pencil out and find the best the best and highest use for that property. Sounds like uh, Gino here. We, we got another partner who only likes the, the bigger stuff, but uh, Gino falls in love with these 25 like, unit ones, like, and there's always like a conflict. Like the <laughs> no, I, I yep. like to get your mind wrapped around them. Uh, what is your market? What, what uh, market are you investing in right now? So I'm in an area about an hour and a half southwest of Seattle. So like towards the ocean, we're the closest ocean beach to Seattle. Uh, it's called Aberdeen. It's famous for Kurt Cobain. And okay, I thought oh, I heard that yeah. name before. I was like, Where yeah, is yeah, yeah. Aberdeen's famous for Kurt Cobain. And so, uh, funny story actually. My very first rental house that I bought. Well, I, so after I sold that first house, I got uh, all of a sudden I was homeless and my I was got married. I used that twenty thousand to get married and uh, needed a place to live. So I found this other cheap duplex. It was two houses on one lot. And I bought that and uh, lived in it, lived there for a couple of years, well, I, I lived there for a year, then I moved out and I rented out the units. But the whole time I was there and even afterwards, people would always complain about pictures, like flashes of light in their people, people taking pictures of their house. And I never knew why until like three years later when some Swedish tourists knocked on the door and they wanted a tour of the Cobain house. And uh, we found out this was actually Kurt Cobain's childhood home. It's listed on his birth certificate. You can so, remember. Uh, random. <laughs> I know. Isn't that weird? Like... Uh, and nobody knew it when we bought the house. I mean, it was just got had been lost in history. And now I, and actually, I found out he lived in both halves of the duplex, like both houses. So I'm probably the only guy on earth that can say they own two of Kurt Cobain's former houses. <laughs> All right, wait a minute. Here, how do we how do we monetize this? I think, I think I know, there's better I use than a, than a duplex here. I know a little duplex rented for like 500 bucks a side. I'm like or 600. I'm like, man, I gotta I, do an Airbnb or something and get the tourists in here. Uh, you know, they can get, stay get in few, Cobain's yeah, first get house. Get a few plaques and the or, or let's get a hold of VH1 and see what uh, see if we can bring them in and do some kind of documentary or something. Exactly. I, I talked to a guy recently who's a, a music producer out in Nashville. He's a, a big producer and uh, he's also a real estate investor. And so we were talking about this. I told him that story. He's like, dude, we need to record an album in that house. <laughs> <laughs> he's like that. That has to be done, and I'm like, come on out. So Bring someday maybe we'll, yeah, someday maybe we'll record an album there. That'd be really cool. How is the market out there, Brandon? Is it? I mean, I know Seattle's really hot. I see from bigger pockets a lot of Seattle guys. I mean, it's hard to find deals out there, right? 
Yeah, Seattle's pretty hot. My area is a little bit lesser so. And, you know, this just goes down to like that whole – I like to say a lot of times that when people complain about they can't find any good deals, I would say usually within an hour and a half drive, you can find something somewhere. And I'm like that perfect example. Like our typical houses go for under $100,000. Unlike Seattle where it's six fifty dollars um, yeah. or even higher. You know, here – you know, I mean I, I'm picking up a house next week for $23,000. I mean – this is crazy, but like you can get that because it's a smaller area. I mean, we got maybe a hundred thousand people in my county, and uh, it's a, you know lower income. They rent for less, but and it's not a hot market either. It's not cold. It's just not like I don't expect multiple offers when I make an offer. If there Even are, if you then get five hundred bucks a month on that, you should be fine, though, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the the, the cash flow is great. It's definitely a cash flow market. I do not buy anything hoping that it goes up in value. I mean, hopefully, appreciation will. You know, follow along with inflation, but I don't buy for that reason. Uh, at least, at least not in most areas of this town or this county. That's a great point. That's the next question I want to ask you: is How has your investment strategy changed over the past five or ten years since you started investing? That is a fantastic question, and because it does, right? Every investor they change yeah. as they go through their life. So, I mean, my original goal was I had this crappy job. I was working at a bank, and I hated it. And I thought, you know, I need. I need $3,000 a month to pay my bills. That's it. If I could just make $3,000 a month, then I would be quote unquote retired. And I said, okay, so I'm going to go get that. This is when I was like 23. I set that goal. And when I was 27, so four years later, I hit my 30th unit and I'm averaging about a hundred bucks in cash flow after, you know, everything's said and done, all of the expenses. And so I hit my 3,000. I said, okay, well, I'm done. And so that was like the first phase of my life was getting that freedom number, that financial freedom uh, thing. Since then though, it's shifted to where I want less junk and better quality properties because I don't care about the cash flow as much anymore. Uh, Brandon and, snobbing. Getting I snobbing. know, exactly. That's, that's <laughs> what it is. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to deal with the little duplex that I can pick up for 50 grand and rent out to you know, a bunch of Section 8 tenants, which there is a market for that and there's a strategy for that. And it worked for me very, very well. I just I don't want it anymore. Now I want the bigger properties. I want nicer things and uh, you know, I'll spend a little bit more for that. How do you analyze a property, Brandon, when you go out and take a look at the numbers? What, what are your uh, criteria? Yeah, sure. So the first thing I look at is, I mean, obviously location. So let's say I'm pulling up a list from my agent. And I'm, I mean, not that I only use MLS. I do some direct mail marketing and driving for dollars and stuff. But let's just say I get a list from my agent of, I don't know, 20 uh, single family houses in my area that he thinks I should look at. I'll do a quick and dirty like through each one, is this a location that I even care about? And right off the bat, 10 of them are going to be gone because I just won't buy in those locations. And then from what's left, I'll do a very like, I'll use maybe the 2% rule or the 2% test as they say. So I'll look at it and say, okay, well, this is a single family house for 50 grand. It'll rent for $1,000 a month. That's 2%. I'll, I'll pursue that and I'll look more deeper into it. Now, anything below 1%, I won't touch. Typically, Anything above two is almost for sure a slam dunk, and those are really, really hard to find. And usually everything's in between. And so I gauge that. If it looks enticing enough, then I'm left with, out of that original 20, I might be left with two or three that actually look like they might work out. I'll do a full analysis of them. I'll sit down and plunk out all the numbers and look at the, you know, I'll, I'll, I mean, pretty much estimate everything. I, I'm obviously a bigger pockets guy, so I was the guy in charge of building the uh, bigger pockets rental property calculator. So I run everything through that. And then uh, if it looks like a decent option, I'll make an offer. If it gets accepted, then I'll go look at the property and, and start working towards it. I want you to give a plug for the site because that calculator is awesome. Um, you have fantastic people on that site giving opinions, giving ideas. I mean, it is a great place, a great resource for investors to go on. And I think that that calculator really helps people out a lot. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, like, all I did pretty much was I took my spreadsheet that I've been using and developing for like five years, and then I just took it and said, well, this would be a lot nicer if it was like a web app. So I just, we made it on the web app and uh, just kind of continually tweaked it based on people's suggestions and what other people do. And now I use that almost exclusively. But what's great about it is, you know, we look at it from being experienced. But when you're first starting out, you have no idea how to analyze a property. You go yeah. through it fairly easily and fairly simply, and it really, I mean, it works great. So I, I think you guys did a really great job with that. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, like that was the goal is keep it simple because, I mean, you could get really complicated with those things. But newbies are just going to get overwhelmed and they'll never do anything. So, you know, keep it simple at the beginning and you can always, you know, get more advanced later. It seems like you're just expanding into, into so many areas of your life. How have you built your teams and what advice do you have for team building? Sure. So, I mean, I, I keep my team fairly small. I mean, I have one part-time uh, property manager who you know works in-house. Uh, my wife handles a lot of the property management. I have an assistant who works for me just recently. We hired her a few months back. Uh, so, I mean, like 
for me, everything I do, I mean, everything in life, this is not just real estate, everything I do comes down to, like, I ask myself, how can I never do this again? And it's really bad. Like, it's to the point where, like, <laughs> like even, like, I'm outsourcing things, like, activities that I volunteer for at church. I'm like, how do I not have oh, to do this? And get, yeah, get somebody else to do it. Like, my assistant does volunteer work for me so that I, and it's really bad. But, I mean, my whole my whole theory is, like, I want to try to systematize everything and make a process for it so somebody else could take over that if I get hit by a bus. And so everything from my deal analysis uh, to my you know, driving for dollars, I mean, my assistant is kind of learning how I do all of that stuff. And I'm just a big believer in that because I want to do what I want to do and I don't want to do what I don't want to do. And I spent too many years doing what I don't want to do. So I'm trying to make that change lately. Now we're going through the same thing right now. I am trying to systematize everything everything at this point and it's uh it's 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 a challenge but man you get there it makes it a lot easier at the end of the road so yeah definitely let me ask you how is it working with the wife i know i was thinking the same it's, thing that's tough man she's gonna beat you up or something I can't do that. <laughs> it actually we work really really well together um like when we were starting we did all of our own work like every flip we did every rental we bought we bought a lot of fixer uppers and we would go in together i mean we would get off work. She worked at Starbucks. She'd start work at three in the morning. I'd get up at three in the morning and go to work on a rehab. And then she'd get off work and come join me at the rehab. And we'd work on it until 10 o'clock at night. I mean, so that was the first slave like, labor really is what this it was. was. <laughs> the first, yeah, the first few years was so much slave labor. Uh, and she did, she did good work. So yeah, ever since then she, we, she's very system focused as well, or at least I've kind of trained her to be so. So like she has her systems that I have mine and and they work generally pretty well. And when they don't, we figure out how to make them work better together. That's you know. great. Yeah, I used to work with my wife two years when I had the restaurant. And I met her there. We got married. And I think it's one of the best things you can do as a relationship. If you guys can work together, you spend a lot of time together. You have, you have so many things that are in common. I mean, it's just a great way to spend the day, especially with someone you really care about. That, that, that's awesome. But Gino, yeah. how, many, how many of the properties has your wife been to? Uh, my wife has been to zero properties. So. <laughs> Listen, my, my wife's been to, I think, one. And yeah. that's about it. So they're, they're, she's that's super funny. engaged, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think my wife's been to more properties than I've been to now, I think. So and that's, uh, she enjoys it. So that's good. But we're having a kid. We're actually two months away from having our first kid. So oh, congrats. Every, it, thanks. Yeah. Everything changes now, I'm sure. I mean, I already it started to. She can't move around quite as fast as she did before. So oh, it's all going to change. This is great. You're, Losing you're, a worker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So let me ask you, what is your best real estate investing advice or tip for, for the listeners? Um, I would say to focus on – so this is something I've learned over the years and maybe, maybe this isn't the best tip for newbies because it's hard to know this until you've been through it. But I'll say it anyway. You know, Tim Ferriss is fond of talking about the 80-20 rule in the book The 4-Hour Workweek. And most people know what that the 80-20 or the Pareto's principle is. It's like you know, 80% of – uh, what you get is from 20% of what you put into something. So, you know, 80% of the world's wealth is owned by 20% of the people. So I realized over the last couple of years that that is entirely accurate to my rental properties. In fact, 20% of my rental properties give me 80% of my income today, of my cash flow. And I look at that and I'm like, why do I own the other 80%? And it's because I bought deals that weren't good enough. And so today, kind of my best piece of advice is focus on the 20% that you know, and not on that 80% that's going to give you nothing. Focus on the best deals only. Do fewer deals, but do better deals. You know, like I just, I think when I look back, I just bought a lot of stuff that I should not have bought. And again, maybe I needed to go through that process and needed to walk through it, but uh, you know, it was you're painful it, sometimes. You're growing, you know, you're yeah, you're growing, happen, you're right? learning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I got some properties today that I will never make money on them. I mean, I, at the end of the day, at the end of every year, I break even about. And over time, you know, I'll, I'll you know, maybe they'll go up in value a little, and I'm paying the loan off. But but you're not really, paying the loan off. The tenant is. So the tenant is paying. At some exactly. point, you're going to get some cash out of it. Hopefully. Exactly. Yeah, I like to look at you know real estate has I always call it four wealth generators. There's the loan pay down, the cash flow, the appreciation, and the tax benefits. I'm I'm not getting the cash flow. I'm getting the other three. Mm-hmm. That said, like. I don't know. I kind of feel like but it's, it's in a bad neighborhood. It's not an improving neighborhood. A couple of these properties. Don't and want I'm the like, wife and future kid going over there. Exactly. Yeah, I would not send her over there. And so now I'm like, you know, I don't regret buying them. There's, I mean, not a piece of me regrets it because because of those properties, I learned lessons. That said, I won't buy them anymore, and I don't advise other people to necessarily buy them. You know, if you can learn those lessons off somebody else's failures, like my own, then that's better than making them yourself. But I do know people have to make their own mistakes. Brandon, that 80-20 rule is so powerful because I was just talking about it with Jake today. Uh, he was complaining about an employee. 
And he said he was on the phone for an hour, wasting his time. And I'm like, Jake, it's the 80-20 rule. You're, you're wasting 80% of your time on 20% of the staff. So, yep. I mean, that just it's just, you know, even with your tenants, you have we have uh, almost 700 units. So we have so many wow. tenants. You get mad with three or four tenants a month, and you're saying to yourself, yep. they're such bad tenants. But it's the, that's not even 80-20. That's 95-5. So yeah. if you put that, keep that in perspective, I think that would really serve everybody well on the call. It's just to say, hey, that's how, that's how life works. And you, know, you just got to cut out the fat, basically. Yeah, and th- I'm a big believer in that. So we have this phrase that we use a lot about firing our tenants. Like I will fire because that's exactly true. 10% of our tenants cause 90% of the drama or, or 1% causes 99%. Most tenants are great, but mm-hmm. you know, some of them are just really terrible. So we just get them out. Like I just, a, lo- a couple years ago, I just decided, you know what, this is stupid. Why am I putting up with them? So when their lease ends, I just tell them, Hey, sorry, we're not renewing it. And they move out. Or if they're on a month to month, I just ask them to leave. Mm-hmm. And uh, I stopped dealing with that mess. I just didn't want to deal with the drama anymore. Do you manage your own properties, Brandon, or you have a management company helping you out? So we, we manage them ourselves. I have a, a part-time uh, manager like in-house who does the phone mm-hmm. calls and showing units. And uh, my wife does all the paperwork, which is going to eventually shift over to either a bookkeeper or my assistant. We're not really sure yet. Uh, but yeah, we do it all in-house right now. We have a property manager on two properties, and it's terrible. I mean, just it's really bad. And so uh, if there were better options for property management, I'd probably hire it out. But there's not a lot of options in my little area. Pick up another 100 units and get someone on full-time. I know. I, 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 I've, thought, I've thought very – we've had that exact conversation is should I go bigger or smaller? And that's what we kind of decided is we have to go bigger. Yep. I, I can't maintain at 40-some units. It's too awkward. It's not big enough. It's not small enough. So we'll go bigger. That's, that's one of those things though, when you tell newbies, they don't understand that. They're like, what are you, crazy? And, and yep. you always fight about that. Our first property was a 26-unit property, 25-unit property, and I fell in love with the property. I mean I know most investors, they're not supposed to fall in love with it, but I fell in love with it. And all of a sudden, we start buying these really big complexes, and I'm, I'm just dying to buy these little ones again because I just feel it's my comfort level. But with the economies of scale you get with these big properties where you can hire out a maintenance guy, hire out a full-time leasing agent, there's something to be said about that. And if you can go bigger, I, uh, I, I would recommend it to everybody. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that. I, I really think, Brandon, if you picked up like 100 units and tech and with what you currently have, if it's close enough, I really think, in my personal experience, it would make your life easier. Yeah, so. I think so too. I think that's definitely probably the way to go uh, versus shutting everything down, which I don't want to do. So yeah, Don't shut it down, man. You got to keep going. You got to keep going. I got this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what would you say is your best habit for success? Mm, I wake up early. I mean, not, not I early. I know, 3 right o'clock. Here. I'm like, man, yeah, no. I'm still sleeping, <laughs> man. What's this guy doing? Yeah, that, that was back in the day. I don't do that anymore. But uh, I mean, like I get up like 5, 5.36 um, and I don't have to do anything officially until like maybe like 8 or 9. I don't really start my day. But I have those couple hours in the morning where I'm just like alone. My wife's not even up then usually. And I just like – I plan out my day every single day exactly what I'm going to get oh, done. I love that. Same yeah, way. I put it – yeah, and I put it in my calendar. Time blocking revolutionized my life when I learned yep. that concept of put – I mean every little thing like this podcast in my calendar. I mean everything that I do, I even like – Two hours of I'm recording my audiobook right now. I wrote a book last year, a couple of them, and one of them I'm recording the audiobook. I put that in there. This morning from six to seven thirty, I sat in this chair recording the audiobook. And I just I don't have a choice. I just I live by my schedule and uh, I schedule what's important. Dude, loud and clear. Same I, like identical to what you just said. Preach That's into the choir. Awesome. That's, That's right. So yeah. Um you mentioned um book. What is uh what's your favorite book? Um ooh. Uh real estate or otherwise. Either or, man. Business, anything business related. Uh, that's mostly you know sure. listeners out there. Yeah, I'm. I'm a big fan of the One Thing uh, by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan. Oh, I, yeah. I absolutely, yeah, I love that book. I've read it, I think, nine times now or wow. ten times, <laughs> like as on repeat on Audible. I've listened to it so many times, just walking around. Uh, I do a lot of walking for dollars, or I used to anyway, when it's not raining here in the Northwest. Like summertime, I do a lot of walking for dollars. Well, just I'll go walk for two, three hours and just listen to an audio book while I'm looking for potential deals. It's not the most time, you know, like productive thing but it's just good for health so no, it's i do good it good education too i love audible yeah, i've been wearing yeah. it out um yeah yeah just focus you know you're so focused you're just walking around doing two things uh-huh. listening and looking for deals and uh it's amazing i got, what you can I got this routine um our nanny leaves uh she's here monday wednesday and friday and i walk my daughter uh, around our neighborhood monday wednesday friday I plug in the audible and yep. and just educate it's great no. Yeah, it's actually one thing I look forward to having a, uh, my you know little girl coming up here is i'm like i'm gonna be able to take her for walks just it's like fun yeah, yeah it's gonna be awesome um, what, uh, what is your biggest mistake in, uh, in real estate to date? Mm. So I did a deal one time where, uh, 
I bought it was a duplex located in a great neighborhood. It had this great view. You could even see the ocean from it, and it was it was awesome. And I bought this thing for like forty grand, and I got an I thought it was an incredible deal on it. I ended up working on it. My that was back in my I did all the work myself. You know, age um, where my wife and I did that entire flip. Uh, we decided to get rid of the duplex, and I mean like turn it into a single family house. So we ripped the outside staircase out. We put a brand new staircase up the middle that I built myself, got a book on how to build a staircase. And I mean, we spent a solid 12 months every day Wow. On this property working. Yeah, complete waste of time. But like I didn't know any better. This is like, you know, two years after I started. So I, I worked on this property all the time. We had a couple other contractors working on it as well. I mean, it was massive, like four thousand square feet. And it ended up being beautiful. Cherry hardwood floors and granite countertops and you know, travertine tile all over. It was amazing. And uh at the end of it, it took nine or ten or eleven months, something like that, to sell again. So essentially it took two years of my life. It probably cost me 10 years of my life because I'll die earlier from all the stress. And then uh, I made, I lost 10 grand. Oh. At the end of the day, I lost 10 grand. Yeah, I mean, the lessons, again, the lessons learned, fantastic. And I tell that story all the time so I can warn other people about some of the mistakes I made. But You're in your early man, 20s, I hope, right? I was, yeah. I, was, okay. I think it was 20, 22, 20, probably 23 Doesn't when I bought it. Doesn't even count. Doesn't count. Yeah, it's you know some people pay that much for college or for you know some like other things like that. So whatever, I you know I lost it on a on a property. All right. I can hear I can hear the love though in your voice about that property. I, I, that, <laughs> yeah. that was the biggest mistake you said. You fell in love with the property with the I did. And oh the church my gosh. and the view and this. Your yep. first mistake was probably taking the duplex out and making a single family. That's probably the oh. thing. That is exactly the mistake. When I look at it now, I mean, I actually ran the numbers. I did a webinar back like six months ago, and for that, I thought it'd be fun to run the numbers as a rental property. I, my my jaw hit the floor. What I realized is I would have been making a thousand dollars a month in cash flow. It would have needed maybe fifteen grand worth of work instead of the sixty five I put into it. And it, I mean, all it needed was paint and carpet. That was it. I just I completely took everything out and tried to make it all because I'd been watching too much TV. You know, the flipping shows and. I fell in love with the idea of making it look beautiful. Yeah, yeah overfixing, and it just couldn't. The neighborhood couldn't support it. I dropped my price like ten times, and it was a disaster. But you know, whatever you learn. Okay, so flip, flip the coin around. It may be the Kurt Cobain thing, but what's what's the best deal and why? I mean, the Kurt Cobain thing's cool, but it's not actually that great of a property. I mean, it's a few not hundred yet. bucks in cash flow. Yeah, not yet. Um, yeah, someday that I actually did put it on the market back when he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I like put it on the market for twice what I bought it for. So I bought it for seventy, I think, and I put it on for one fifty. No one even looked at it, but that's okay. So the best deal I ever did actually was probably my. I have a twenty-four unit apartment complex. It's the biggest property I own, and. Uh, it wasn't so much of a good deal. I mean, it's a solid deal. It's good numbers. I paid 550000 for it. What was cool about the deal was the, the, uh, the way that we put it together. Because I was at the time 25 when I got that one. I had no money at all. I mean, nothing to work with. I had no good credit. I had no job even at the time. Uh, and the way that we did it, I mean, it's a long story. I don't need to go into the whole thing. But essentially, I found the property – uh, so I will say I found the property from somebody from church. Actually, I mentioned to them I wanted to buy an apartment complex, and they said, "Hey, actually, we have one we want to we want to sell." And it was like this weird, like, "Oh, we should probably talk then." And so I found the property through them. They knew I didn't have any money, but they wanted me to get the deal, uh, and because they were older, they wanted to retire, but they got tired of dealing with this property. So anyway, they sold it on seller financing to me. However, I didn't even have the 15,000 needed that they were only asking 15,000 down because that's what they needed to pay the taxes and closing costs. And so I didn't even have that. So I ended up doing a lease option on the property, like a triple net lease option for six months to save up the money needed for the down payment. Then I didn't have the repair money. So then I called up my parents and I said, Hey, will you guys partner on this deal with me? and uh, supply the down payment. And they said, well, we don't have that kind of money. I said, I need 60 grand. They said, we don't have that. I'm saying, well, you have a home equity line of credit. And so we ended up, so I ended up using a home equity line of credit, a triple net lease option, a seller, then we converted it to seller financing, a partnership, and then I refinanced it three years later into a portfolio lender, all to get that deal done without having to use my own money. And it was a disaster. I mean, like, it was a I should say disaster because it worked out great, but it was three years of like yeah, but you got it done. Hard work. I got it done, and that was that's why it's my favorite deal because like it just shows that super creative. Yeah, I mean, no, there's not a single book that says, "Hey, how do you buy an apartment complex?" Here's how you do it. First, you can negotiate a triple net lease option. You know, like you you don't learn that thing, like that kind of thing. Like creative finance cannot be taught in that way. Like this is the one strategy you should do to buy deals. I mean, every deal requires its own little finagling, and that one was just a complicated one that. 
ended up working today. It's thousands of dollars a month in cash flow, and it's one of our best properties, if not our best property. That was college right there in three years, my friend. You did you did the uh, quick version of it. Yeah, no kidding. There you go. There you go. And we also did we did most of the rehab ourselves. And I it's mean, paying you. <laughs> and it's paying me today. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a yeah. It, it was great. It's great. I love that property. Um, I can feel the love again, Jake. See that <laughs> love, love fest in the house. I, okay, I should say this. I hate the property. I love the cash flow. Now you I don't. I don't even go there anymore. But I, I love the cash flow on that property. And and you know because of our systems we have in place and the in house kind of part time manager who takes care of it. I mean, I maybe work an hour a month on that property, if if, if at all. I mean, like there's really no questions they ask about it because it's just that's one of the nice things about multifamily is it's so systematizable. Everything's just a repeatable process. The same rehab project goes into every single unit. And yeah, it's pretty nice. I like that. That's awesome. Very cool. I wanted to ask you a question about networking. You seem like a network guru. Do you have any tips for networking? Hmm. I mean, so first of all, people get weird about it, in my opinion. Like, some mm-hmm. people are like, you know, they'll come up and be like, hey, will you be my mentor? And then I'm like, I, I don't know what that means. And that's, yeah. that's an odd thing to say, right? So, my whole thing with networking is just build friendships. Be a friendly person and build friendships. And so, you know, if that happens to be around people who like real estate, that's ideal. And so where do real estate people hang out? Usually real estate clubs, they hang out in bigger pockets forums, they hang out, you know, at, at meetup.com. There's a bunch of meetups of real estate. So I go to those things a lot. Is that and like, just is that like farmersonly.com? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> exactly. exactly. You know, last year for Bigger Pockets, April Fool's Day, we actually launched a, a real estate investor dating site. Uh, and it, I mean, it, it was the, probably the funniest thing I've ever done. I don't think it's still up anymore, but it was, I don't remember what it was called, but it was about finding your cash flow positive spouse. And the whole thing looked and well, functioned. Well, I think you found that, man. She gets up at three, does the flip <laughs> for you. You got it. <laughs> I think I used her as a testimonial on the site. Seriously. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty awesome. Um, what uh what project are you excited about right now? Um hmm. So the property I mentioned earlier that I'm getting for 23, which will be the cheapest property I ever bought. Uh I'm kind of excited about that just because it's it, it's a totally different project than I've done. Like I mean it's a a low end property in a fairly low end area. I mean stable but just a low income area. Uh, and that sounds weird but like I've never done a, and I, I'm, I'm going to fix it up as a rental, but I'm probably going to put it on the market for a short time just to see if it sells, just to see what happens. Anyway, I'm excited about it mostly because it's something I haven't done and my assistant is doing everything. She found the deal. She negotiated the price down from 50 down to 23. Uh, she is managing the contractors over there. I mean, she's doing everything. So I'm actually like building a system, a repeatable system that I'll be able to do on multiple deals with this one property. So that's kind of fun. No, seriously. It's so funny too because when we started out, I was doing everything. I was trying to do bookkeeping. Gina was trying to do it. And what we found out is we weren't really good at that stuff. And like yeah. you're just talking about this assistant. She just negotiated a better deal than you have so far. Exactly. Just yep. saying, I mean, but that's that's awesome for you. That's great. I love that she did that too because I could, I could teach her how to negotiate, but when I get down to actually negotiating with people, I'm terrible at it because like I start to like feel bad for them and whatever. But instead with her, I was like, no, your number that you came up with on your analysis that I made her do said 23. That's all you can pay. Yeah. And like it, there was no emotion involved. It was just like it was a number. And so she had to do what she had to do and she got it. Well, so. it allowed you to step back and be more yep. objective. And then she yes. had a mission and she had to accomplish it. That's, that's cool. Yep, it was Brandon, yeah. Cool. Brandon, my my technique for that negotiation is I always tell Jake to blame the partners. I can't <laughs> pay fifty. I, my partners will not allow me to pay fifty. What's the best you can do? I got to go back to my partners. So just always blame the she other person. Shut up, man! We're recording this. <laughs> <laughs> I I blame my spouse. I'm like, oh, Heather says I can't do it. Sorry, and you know most people accept the spouse. Oh, his spouse says that. I'm like, oh, okay, that works. <laughs> man, now this this has been fun. Um, so what's the best way for listeners to get a hold of you? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm on all the social media stuff, you know, everything, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, uh, bigger pockets. That's probably the best way potentially to find me there. And that's where I'm most interactive and stuff. So, uh, yeah, but, uh, Twitter is at Brandon at BP. So, okay. Tweeting it out. I took a few notes, uh, some really good stuff. Early riser. Um, yeah, that works for some people and sounds like it's been very effective for you. I think the the biggest takeaway is a daily planner, um, each hour slotting it. Uh, sounds like it's made a, a huge impact on your life. Um, the book that was recommended, One Thing, by Gary Keller. And uh, good luck with the new baby. It's going to be awesome. It's going to change your life. It's going to be great. Hey, thanks. That's what I hear. It's going to be fun. Uh, so, hey, thank you very much. It was great having you. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Brandon. 
We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.